So greetings, everyone. I want to welcome you to a very special installment of Unraveling Religion. I'm your host, Joel Lessies, and I'm here with Rochester's own poet, Bill Pruitt. Bill, how are you today? I'm great, Joel. Thank you for inviting me. Um, I'm, a, I'm a, a poet, a fiction writer, and a storyteller, and I've been writing full-time, especially since I retired from teaching English as a second language seven years ago. Uh, it's, it's the first time that I've been able to write regularly uh, in an in extended way, and um, I'm always looking for places to read, <laughs> and, I, and I very much appreciate this opportunity. Knowing your work from Before Your Quiet Eyes, I've heard you speak and read at First Tuesday at well, Writers and Books and also at the coffee shop on South Avenue. Yes, Pure, Pure Kona. Um, actually, the, the, the coffee shop, I, I did do a couple of readings there. I mean, I mean at open mics, um, um, equal grounds. And uh, um, at Pure Kona on Main Street, um, it used to be on Main Street, it's not anymore. On, on the old weekly Thursday readings. Coffee Connection, right? Right, that's right, Coffee Connection. So, I mean, really, you know, it's an interesting process. Uh, we share this love of poetry, you know, the process of writing versus actually lifting it off the page with your breath, like to, to, to speak it after the process of writing it. What is that like for you? How does that work for you? That's, that's, a, that's a really good question. I, I, I think that I, I originally discovered uh, the writing of poetry as a way to as as a way to uh, be with the world, and uh, I I gradually started I started writing and I started um, giving readings for a while. Now I understand that people need to look away when they're listening in order to get what it, what what's happening in the poem sometimes. But I felt my poems were simple and were basically directed towards speech, as they still are. Uh, it was harder to, uh, it was hard, it was frustrating for me. I felt like, uh, you know, my audience was not really relating directly to me as I, as I had hoped. So I became a storyteller and I, <clears throat> after, after seeing that happening in, um, in a venue, which allowed, which was really for adults, not excluding children, but, but emphasizing adults. And um, I, I did, I've done storytelling for quite a while. And then that led me into teaching. All the time, I think, um, I, I felt like it has to be connected to the breath. It has to come off the page. Um, I, I truly believe in poetry as an oral art. And now, is, the last 20 years or so, I've been writing fiction. To me, the primary labor, the primary struggle there is to, is to, is to relate it to the breath and to keep, keep it off the page and, and really to construct sentences which are part of our speech, part of direct speech. Oh, yeah, so that the, the language is common and accessible. That's right. That's exactly what I believe in. And what, so tell me a little bit of the difference between poetry versus storytelling versus fiction writing. Well, you know, when I started writing poetry, I used to look down on fiction and think uh, th th they aren't um, sensitive to language like poets are. And, and then I got into storytelling. Now, storytelling is interesting because it's not exactly fiction and it's not exactly poetry, but it is sensitive to language. It's even more so perhaps than poetry because it's avowedly oral. Uh, sometimes even po poets don't realize they're working in an oral art. And for storytellers, they absolutely require themselves to be sensitive to language because you're, one, one, one storyteller, one teacher I had, Donald Davis from North Carolina, he said that telling a story is like taking taking someone through a room, and he's pointing out what's in the room. And he says you don't you don't keep going if they don't see it. You 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 wait on them until they see what you're what you're pointing to, and that's exactly my 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 aesthetic. You know, the, con the connection is dynamic and alive. So I'll, very you much stop so. When they stop, yeah, that's right. That, that is a difference between that storytelling and poetry. That's that's a big distinction. And I and I tr truly believe that, you know, I, I have this conversation, it, it comes up quite often. And just the other day, I posted a poem, and someone was telling me how they, they, uh, they were taken to a place. And I said, that's exactly what I want in a poem. I want it to take you to a place. And stories as well. The, the poetry, storytelling, the fiction writing, all 
it's all travel for sure. You know, the, the Buddhist, I think, has, I feel like the Buddhist has a, um, a framework that, that the existentialist doesn't necessarily have or want. And what's important for the Buddhist is, is to practice, in, is to be practicing, whether it's the practice of meditation or the practice of loving kindness or the practice of art, that the, the person practicing Buddhism is free of that underpinning of that foundation um, because to be self-conscious of it is to lose you know lose the value of what you have do you mean the mental construct of buddhism itself i mean the day-to-day -day thought or, or i should say the moment-to-moment -moment thought um uh, just to be without thought to be without thought yeah i i have a i have a poem here which i, I think in some way might relate to what we're saying. It's called Magic and Community. Share an experience, strike a bond, precious thing. But when we practice magic, which includes all art, whatever bond is struck is incidental to something else. On the other hand, we, the way we form groups is not magic, but magical, like birds on a power line until the group acquires a not group to be defined by. And mingling becomes defiled with meaning and manipulation, which blight the bond, social buffering hardens into law, which falls under the will of those who think the immaculate sphagnum ground cricket that is the universe is a machine. Thus do we invoke magic, which includes all art to keep the cell walls permeable, restore the sacred power of touch. I think that in that conversation we were just having prior to the poem, I'm thinking about the, the struggles uh, to pull away from self-consciousness, which, are, which are, seem to be you know, related to thought, to, to uh, discursive thought, um, and, and that it's the practice of the art whether that art is indeed writing or meditating or cooking or walking, it's the practice of that art that, that keeps, us, keeps us alive and feeling alive primarily, keeps actually feeling in present in thought instead of being uh, assigned a separate place, a separate room. Contrasting it with a ritual that's been deadened through time. Exactly. Well, you know, it was really your your kind of the, the inquiry or the Zen aspect of your poetry that drew me to, you know, do you have any, you often, you often are very skillful at pointing out the thinking self versus the true self. Ah, uh, <laughs> actually, that's, that's kind of interesting. Um, I have a, I have a poem from an upcoming book that I, I, I want to say that the poem that I just read is from my book. Um, the Binding Dance, and you can get that at Ken Kelbaugh's bookstore before your quiet eyes on Monroe Avenue, or you can get it from me at my website, wpruitt.com. Oh, yeah, yeah. Great. This, this, poem is, <laughs> this poem is actually the first poem in an upcoming book I have from uh, Foothills, Foothills Publishing. The book is called Hands No Hands, and here's a, 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 an autobiographical poem called Youthful Indiscretion, which is exactly the, about the subject that you just mentioned. Once I got up in front of a group of people and preached a sermon about the absurdity of evolution. Or maybe it was the absurdity of atheism. I'm not sure. It was actually just a talk. I was 12 or something. I didn't use preacher rhetoric, but logic, simple reasoning. I think I hit a home run although the preacher did follow with some quasi-scriptural corrections, which I was duly put out by, but I had my moment. Just a few years later, I saw this movie, Inherit the Wind, and I saw I had it all wrong. It wasn't so simple. Only simple people saw it that way. And I laughed and cringed to think I was one of them. So, I was twice red-faced, 
first by the preacher who found my perfect circle not quite complete, and by myself, who got taken in by these rubes. But instead of taking Darrow as my new model, it was the arch journalist Mencken I wanted to be, who scorned and ridiculed not bigotry, but love itself. Deaf to Darrow's chastening, who warned that it was reasoning that was simple, lacking heart. So that, that gets into a little bit, you have to know the play a little bit, the, 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 the play of Inherit the Wind, but the, the Mencken character is full of vituperation, excoriating uh, the, the character of William, William Jennings Bryan. He's Matthew Brady is his name in the character. But uh, Darrow, Darrow stops him and says, you know, basically in so many words, just this is this is not about that. This is he was doing his best. You know, he's he's trying to hold up something of, of his own. And, yeah. you know, you have to allow for that. Uh, but for me, you know, somehow I gravitated to Mencken and I think I, I decided I was going to be a journalist based very much on Mencken, which I, which I did until I got through my junior year in college when I realized that for some reason it wasn't taking. <laughs> but that's, for me, I mean, I, there are people who, who do journalism who, who don't succumb to this, but for me, it was very much a part of that dead ritual thing that you just mentioned versus, versus something meaningful for the person. Can you teach me a little bit about Mencken? Mencken was, um, he was, he was a, a, a maven about language. And he wrote a, a, door, a doorstopper of a book about the American, American, Ang American English. I was, I've always been interested in language. So that was another uh, thing that brought me closer to Mencken. And he was, a, he, he was mostly, he didn't write um, in the way of creative, what we would call creative works, but he was very, he was very witty and sharp. Mm -hmm. um, he would have, I don't know if he ever associated with those people at, uh, with Dorothy Parker, but he, yeah. I, I don't know if he was, he was pretty close to that time, maybe a little before. Yeah, I think a little before. He was very much like that. His observations were, were, were very much about, you know, stepping aside from people who, who didn't get it. He was very, um, above all that mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and uh, and you know he didn't he didn't apologize for his own arrogance mm -hmm. so i mean t the, you know there's he i can still admire him very easily but i think for me he was not a good influence i was i was under his spell basically yeah but he brought you to the edges of something that grew you into something else that's right that's right I'm curious, Bill. Uh, tell me, tell me about what what is your draw? What is your personal, like your 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 affinity for language? What is the, what, has it always been there since childhood? Or mm -hmm. yeah, I don't know. It's just uh, it's one of those things. I mean, for me, is it, is it its power? Is it its its openness? Is it its bridging? What, I what think is... you know what I think it is. Is like I need process to be. I'm I'm very bad about process. I mean, for much of my life, I was blind to process, and I still am because I, I don't pay attention to how things work, and it's a great labor for me because I know that I have to do that now. I have to do that. So for me, one thing that I care about how it works is language, and I think part of it has to do with the closeness to the breath and the and the heart, because yeah. it comes from our it can come from our innermost selves. And um, so to me, that's really fascinating. And I, when I, when I, I went to, um, I went to graduate school um, in order to get a, get, you know, get a training in teaching English as a second language. Yeah. And I was so overcome by it. sometimes I would, uh, sometimes I would, I would feel like I was looking at the inside of a, huge machine, you know, like when you're studying how language is put together and how, how it's actually used and how, how we form it in, you know, the, 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 the actual formation of, of speech in phonetics, yeah. the study of that just 
just totally blew me away. I just loved it. And I think it's like I say, it's maybe because I, you know, that is my, that is my one connection with process. <laughs> that, that, that seems, it seems a very emphasized connection with process. And I can see where it is, where we talk about the non-conceptual, the, the mm -hmm. discursive thinking versus just being and, and mm -hmm. language is a bridge to that, right? Yes, I mean, yes, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, it's I mean, interesting. thought in itself, you know, if you've ever spent a day alone in your in a in a house inside, especially inside, ever spent a day inside um, alone, as I often do, as, as I as I'm retired and. Um, my wife and I live in this house and sometimes she's gone. Um, it can be very much like cobwebs, right? Um, you're, you, you, just, you just get beset by thinking. Uh, the best thing to do is to go outside and take a walk. But aside from that, one thing that you, you're aware of is that speech, if you haven't engaged in it all day, speech can be a great clarifier and, okay. and a crystallizer and a, and a, and a definer um, speech in some ways draws a border around all that and say, okay, maybe that's as it is, but here's this and it's speech and it's language. And it, and it's a definite, it's a, it's a thing that makes a definite statement just by being a thing. What you express yeah. is, is a kind of uh, subjective truth yeah, yes. and language. What is the writing process for you? If you're, I'm curious about your writing process. How do you form poems? Yeah. It's a good question. Um, many, many different ways. Um, I, I, I have, I have a bunch of ideas. I have a, a file of ideas. Uh, I don't go to it very often, but it's there. Ideas, particularly for a poem. I have. I record my dreams. I've re been recording dreams for oh. for fifty years, and I ha I have them all, and I read them every so often. They can't be overemphasized. I find that they grow grow more important as I as I write more. Uh, the book that I had, the Binding Dance, that that I have that I mentioned, it, it's it's in five sections, and the last section is is entirely a poems written in in twenty twenty, and most of them most of them reflect the contingencies of twenty twenty, meaning yeah. politically and um, and 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 the pandemic. Mo I would say most of those poems are, are dreams, and the contingencies. Do you mean if then? I mean the contingencies the, of twenty twenty. I mean the pressure of twenty twenty. Uh, okay. Yeah, the pressure of it, and 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 part of that is political, and part of it is is the pressure of of COVID. Yeah. Uh, so many of those poems, you know, come from dreams. All I all I really have to do with most of them is just arrange them in lines to make them um, stand up, but um, they're mostly in dreams. Would you like me to read one? I would love you to. Yes, please. Well, here's a funny one. It's called Dream Within Dream. <laughs> I'm driving a car with three other people in it, a man and two women. We may be fleeing someone. On the highway, we drive through a fresh pile of goose dropping about four feet high. Later, at a restaurant, I asked my passengers if they weren't suspicious of that pile. How did it get there? When? But nobody seems to know what I'm talking about. Then I understand. That was my dream. No one else was having that dream. They didn't even know they were riding with me in a car. <laughs> Much of what I'm feeling from you is about the, the aliveness, the freshness of experiences, even subjective experiences of like dreams or language the utterance of like language and, and the freshness of like the moment and how those relate. That's, that's really the best way to, um, the best approach I think for having your work read because yeah. um, if the moment isn't fresh now, it's only gonna get less fresh as it goes on. The, the whole goal, the whole struggle is, is to take that freshness and make something which can hold it and keep it, right? Yeah, to keep it bold, really yeah. refresh, to refresh yourself. Yes. How we do that, some through poetry, some through meditation, but with fresh eyes to see the aliveness that is present always. Yeah. I've got another one that I would like to read, and because this one is a very unusual dream that I've never had before. 
and it also it often results in puzzled expressions from people. So I'm gonna I'm gonna read it. It's called "What Am I Doing? Why Am I Here?" And again, it's written in just paragraph form, two paragraphs. I dream I am playing a character whose actions I understand only as the story goes on. I'm a powerful man who has my friends arrest a woman I'm seeking revenge upon. A woman who loves me is with me. I collect evidence on the arrested woman. It is then I understand what is happening, how the plot unfolds. I can see in my character's intensity and singleness of purpose that I intend to execute this woman for her misdeeds and that this will surprise and horrify the woman who loves me and she will resist so the audience will have someone to root for. The poem ends with an epigram from William Blake. To be an error and be cast out is part of God's design. Yeah. Well, that's a really complex dream, right? Yes, it is. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, through different characters, yeah. For yeah, sure. yeah. And, and the dreamer is having that. I guess what I'm interested in is the dreamer is not the narrator there. Right. You know, the, 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 or maybe the, the dreamer is the narrator, but the main character shifts, right? Because I'd just like to cut to the, what I really am interested in about that dream is that how it applies is the metaphor. The metaphor for me is that in our life, we don't always know what our purpose is. Mm -hmm. And we don't always know why we're doing something. That's to me is, is the profound character of that dream. The, the person who's dreaming doesn't understand what he's doing until he does something and he sees the pattern. And I just think that's, that's a great lesson for me, you know, that to watch what you're doing. I mean, you know, we, we, we caution ourselves to be mindful and we think, well, you know, it's kind of a, a labor, a kind of like toil because, you know, why do we need to be mindful? Just maybe we'll, maybe we'll see something we don't see, but actually it's huge because we don't know always what we're doing. We don't know. And, and, and we're not above reproach. <laughs> we're, we're capable of doing bad things. And with that, with that lack of light, with, the with lack that lack of, of light, the yeah. lack of awareness, of course. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, I actually, I had this, um, someone once taught me the body is the subconscious mind and stored in the body. Is yeah. A whole host of information. And yeah. The body itself, the cells of the body are the subconscious mind. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And Antonio Damasio, the neurologist whom I often read, he says that, uh, you know, our consciousness, it's not, it's not actually consciousness, but our awareness is studded with stations in our body, which are constantly reporting back to us about what's going on. In other words, you know, the organs, the glands, you know, in other words, we, and we're, we're aware of it. We have a, 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 a peripheral awareness of it, which only becomes actually conscious if something goes wrong, but, but there's, but they're like reporting. They're like, they're like little monitors. They're little, like little monitors, which are regularly beeping, you know, to make it. And, uh, and, and I, I always think that's, that's, to me, you know, what that is, is like, that makes our body part of the world. You know, we think our body is, is our private, our private uh, property, mm -hmm. you know, our, our, our private domain, but actually our body is part of the world. And that's where, when we get our, our world news, that's the place that reports first. Mm -hmm. And then that, of course, that colors everything else. If we're not feeling well, if we, you know, if we have some, some sensation, physical or medical, mental, that affects how we, how we take in further things that are further away, sources that are further away. I, you know, I, I had a, I had a, I, we mentioned when we were talking it um, before your quiet eyes last about my creative writing mentor, Mage Reagan. Yes. And uh, he, he sparked my poetic life. And uh, I want to share with you, he always said, don't, don't just offer your poems and don't have people just offer your poems to you, but share, right? Yes. So I have this little haiku I want to share with you and I'd be interested um, your thoughts. Yes. Thoughts like this. It's entitled Childhood Remembered. Autumn stream leaf still searching for her lost branch. 
Yeah. Yeah. It's it's, it's true. our our hu our humanness likes connection and the vibrancy of language and the freshness of the moment and the immediacy of things. It does not do quite as well with separation. Yet the separation is necessary for connection. Well, that's interesting to put it that way. The separation is necessary for connection. It's it's true. And um, another way to say it is that you don't know connection without separation, right? Right. Um, yeah. We don't we don't know what it is. You know, like they say, you know, the fish in the sea is not thirsty, and um, yep. uh, it's only when you when you flip out of the water, or the water goes away, that you realize you're in water and that you you need water. Yeah. Let me ask you a question. What, what do you think ego, discursive thought and ego, this and, and the veiled, the veiledness of our human experience, where does that fit into the big picture? What do you think, Bill? Mm. Well, I would say um, my therapist calls, I, I brought up recently to my therapist the necessity of ego. And he called it, he calls it healthy aggression. <laughs> he yeah. says, you need healthy aggression, right? Yeah. And, and I, you know, okay, so, so my own take on ego is that I grew up with a stunted ego or not much ego. And, and that, so I'm, I'm always speaking up for ego because <laughs> I think, you know, we need ego to get out there. To, to, to get up, yeah, negotiate, yeah. and and to even to get up, get out of bed in the morning, you know. Yeah. Um, so, so when you look at it that way, it's like it's like initiating energy, and if you can focus on initiating energy, um, the problems, the other problems we go um, can go away. Um, I, you know, I, I have come it, partly of my study of Buddhism and also my reading of people like Antonio Damasio is that um, if we replace the term ego with the term self, it becomes a little bit more interesting because ego is actually a fraught with a lot of, I think with a lot of, of, of baggage that's like that's God. confusing. It's yes, like exactly, God. exactly. But if, if you say the self, that puts things in a, a little bit of a different light because I've come to think of, you know, the self as being um, less helpful maybe than ego, uh, but but just as just as delusory. <laughs> I, I mean, uh, you know, but it, I used to think when, when I was younger, I, I used to think how how can you say self is delusory? I mean, what is there without self? That's that's what I thought. Now I understand that it is necessary. To believe in self maybe it's necessary to believe in you know ego too in order to understand that you really don't need to believe in it after a while but it's necessary it's so it's part of a it's part of a stage isn't it i guess it's it's a you know certainly when we grow up that's the first thing you know damasio speculates on what what was what happened with the discovery of self he he has this wonderful ruminations about because he studies the, he's the only, he, well, he's one of the few scientists that I've read who talks about mind and self, not just brain and yeah. not just, you know, or the, uh, human beings, but the self. And, you know, he speculates about when it got invented because it surely had to get created sometime. And he imagines human beings, right? human beings in a, in a group, and then having the thought come around, who's thinking this? Where is that thought coming from? What, who is thinking it? I mean, you know, and, and he likens it to, he likens it to, uh, to the Hamlet. The, the, the community is the formation of individuation. Yeah. This this poem I have I think uh, I think I, it would be appropriate to read this poem called Haunted. Um, this poem directly grew out of that that uh, that that passage in Damasio. Haunted, 
This is also from the binding dance. I'm asking a question and so far, no one has answered. It's not like Socrates asking is such and such an action virtuous, nothing like that. My question is who? Every story permits a wonderful life to Divina Commedia, to journey to the end of the night is about who? And is haunted by who? And by mentioning these stories, I've swirled around more ghosts who are haunted by each other and themselves <clears throat> until they find their place in the tale. Transparencies of ourselves we place over the grid of the story and it all comes right. There's the master, there's the one out of control. Courtship is there, a breezy lunch with friends. The one who set herself up for failure. The one who is cast out, justly or not. The one who always lit up the room or settled it. The story that has us all in there, who are all who here. The story that keeps us from killing ourselves over the fact of having consciousness. If I were to tell you, dear friend, the very thing you find cause for suicide is the greatest miracle, you might ask how I know that. My answer is, I don't know how, but I know. That's an important poem, Bill. Yeah, thank you. I, that's, that's I really, important. yeah, I, I feel that it's, it's important to me. It's one, yeah, of those, it's one of those things that happen. You, you, sometimes you just don't know what you know until you, you try to make a structure for it, a frame for it. Yep, yeah, absolutely build that bridge with language. But I, I, I posted that poem once and, and a person wrote back and he said, you know, he thought of Hamlet. And I thought, that's pretty amazing link because that poem was inspired by um, a passage from Damasio in which he was quoting the beginning of Hamlet, yeah. who goes there and mysterious sense of looking, you know, for the ghost who goes there, like who's thinking these thoughts? <laughs> what, what is, what does silence teach you, Bill? Silence? What does silence teach you? Yeah. T silence, silence teaches me the, the blessing of relaxedness. Mm -hmm. um, I'm looking for silence pretty much constantly. Um, it used to be that I, I, I wanted stimulation all the time. Yeah. And now I, I'm looking for, I look for stimulation about half the time and half the time I'm looking for silence. And when I find it, it's like stretching, you know? It's like there's room, there's room for something. Space. It gives me room, it gives me room to breathe, you know? Sometimes I forget to breathe, right? Sometimes I, I, uh, I'm, I'm so hemmed in by thinking, which is its own form of noise. And so if I'm taking your word silence, you're, you're, you're saying that word, uh, you know, literally. And because there's plenty of times when our minds are so, so, you know, so loud, so busy, so fevered that um, we don't know what silence is. And it's actually, it's just like sleep. It's just as important as sleep and we need it. Mm -hmm. Yep. Do you have something from the new book? Yes, um, the new book. Um, so the new book. So this is this is uh, okay. The hands, no hands. Okay, because I have had another new book. The the uh, the one that I was talking about the other the other night. But I'll I'll read something from Hands No Hands. Um, and I'll read this poem. Oh well, I, I actually I wanted to read a. a a dream. This is an incredibly short, short poem, and this is an incredibly simple dream. Or maybe, maybe it's not simple. It's just called Dream Eleven Seven Nineteen, but it struck me. <clears throat> it struck me when I had it. <clears throat> a woman looks into a window of a public space, a science center, or a museum, or zoo, standing next to her horse or dog. I understand she is the triple goddess. So that, my, that was my dream. 
That's interesting. The only the only thing that I I didn't get in there was the perspective. I was I was looking I was watching her from from behind. So she her back was to me, and she was looking into this window, and next to her was a horse or a dog. <laughs> Can you say more about the triple goddess? Yeah, the 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 triple goddess is I I I don't know enough to to elucidate intelligently. Only only that um, Robert Graves made a big impression on me, made that phrase a big impression on me in his his book, The White Goddess. Often the triple goddess was in a it's I I would describe it as a as a a meeting of powers, so that um, it was. And and Gra just just to back up a little bit, Graves' book, The White Goddess, speculates on the existence of a matriarchy before the patriarch, and mm -hmm. speculates that there are many there are many um, examples in our culture, such as the Iliad, that show um, that show uh, uh, the, the 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 remnants of this matriarchy, um, and I guess just the character of Pallas Athena would be one, because she is so powerful and she is such a a vivid figure to my mind the most vivid of all the greek gods and um you know it's hard it's 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 hard to imagine the kind of context that she came out of because she is as powerful as the god of war she's actually more powerful than than ares because they have a they have a, a standoff late in the iliad the triple goddess is grave speculation of about the the great matriarchy before before uh, classical Greece, um, distant Babylonian times, and I, I'm pretty sure that anthropologically it's suspect, but I to me it makes great sense um, in terms of what it what it what it feels like intuitively that this was at one time and the and the triple goddess would have been um you know and now now i'm not able to articulate this very well because he he had distinct identities for these for these different goddesses of asia um yeah. but 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 they were incredibly powerful partly because you know they drew on these these vast resources and more so more i guess what all i wanted to say is that to me, it, I came away with it as, with a sense of more powerful than than we can imagine. What do you, What do you think about What do you think about the, the differences between men and women? They're distinct. They're distinct, and they're 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 almost separate in a certain kind of way. They are they are almost separate. It's so true. You know, it's almost like silence and noise. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's like I was just ta talking about. You know, the the great the great um, salve that silence gives our our poor fevered brains. Almost mm -hmm. feel like that way as a, as a, as a man. I, I think of women that way. Anyway, I think there's there's some kind of elemental con contrast, um, and I and I can't I can't articulate it, other than to say, it's incredibly tense. I so, somewhere. Let's see. I actually have. I think I have a, a, a poem somewhere. I, I don't think I can put my hands on it now, but in my new, new book, uh, which is called The Teacher Who Told Stories, which includes poems and fictions, I call them. And there's a poem in there called Wedding at Shandikin. And in the, there's a line that says, um, with, I, with men I connect with alternating current. But with women, my connection is more direct. That's a paraphrase, a clumsy paraphrase, but I feel that I have a different, I have a completely different kind of connection with women than with men. And of course, that must vary greatly. Uh, individuals must must have to, and of course, you know, I don't know, I don't know if a woman feels that way, if any women feel that way, but I do. There's so many different kinds of energies and people and you know, you know, th this leads me, your 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 thought there leads me to. Maybe something that's a little bit more on the mark for me in this question about men and women, because um, I feel I've come to feel there's a thing about 
there, there's a, a, it's almost a meme when we say the phrase being in love, that that so runs the risk of being calcified a little bit, you know, yep. because yep. It, it's, it's, uh, it's, you know, there are a lot of lies <laughs> connected with that term. There are yep. a lot of lies with the word love. Yep. But the fact is, is that, um, you know, one of my students asked me, what's it like to be in love? And I said, it's like when you can't think of anything else, right? Mm -hmm. And 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 so I've come to feel like, so that's what I'm talking about, being in love. I'm talking about intoxication, right? You're, you're, mm -hmm. It's intoxication. Okay, so so I, I've come to think that um, you, you actually, to be a functioning human being, you have to be intoxicated. <laughs> you have to be in love, at least to be a functioning writer, at least to be a functioning poet. I, I find that it's just essential for me to be, but see, I don't like the phrase in love. That's, uh, I think, you know, we, we might want to toss that out, but you know what I'm talking about now that I've tried to explain myself. Um, it's the, the fodder, the fuel, the fuel that- Yes energy to the, the the words yeah yes yes it, it is it's essential so so how does that happen you know how how do we maintain that and part of it is is you know you have i think it's important to to use memory when you if you don't feel in love right now um you you can remember what when you did what what that was like and you can bring in the, the, the various forms that accompany that feeling. But I, and I, and I think that's, for me, that's a very important thing. But also, the more you practice it, and you, you're not still, this, this is assuming that you're not obsessed by some lost love. If, if you are, then that's different. That makes it totally different. I'm saying, you know, if you're just, you're just fine with your life. But you need, in order to, this is kind of like maybe an alternative to, to ego, you need something to bring yourself into the world, the world of writing, for, for instance. And what that, as you say, fuel, the, the best fuel is, is the intoxication of love, in my experience. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. And, and the more you practice that, the wider it gets. Um, it's true that the more you practice that, the wider your your love grows, and the that more you can love. Yeah, and and um, so I think you know, age, age and time teach that. Age and they time do. Yeah, yeah. They can. They can. You know, they don't always do it. Um, there's there's needs to be something else. But Mage, my creative writing professor, used to say, the whole the totality of aging of of growing older is to beat back cynicism it's to beat back what makes us barnacled or hard. yeah 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 but why is that is that you know what goes on there is it because the alternative becomes becomes more obvious perhaps and more intolerable error is consolidated as blake says yeah it becomes when you become when you become a visible barnacle yourself um you can't tolerate that anymore because it is part of it's, yeah it's part of the revulsion of you know of of engaging in that i think maybe yeah the simple direct teaching from the yi ching says you are looking at the outside of the inside of yourself yeah you kind of project that barnacle everywhere yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, so so for me i i can um i can um actually be so so I should say being being in love as part of it is being touched, being moved, mm -hmm. you know, it, very easily, you know, with the slightest tweak, right? I mean, not that you're go around moved all the time, but you can be moved. And so what am I moved by? You know, you're moved by um, objects of love. That's that's when you, you, you feel yourself go out to something in the world and it, then it comes back to you, right? And... Um, and I feel that the more I practice that, and the more I, as a writer, and the more I, I think the writing, writing is about making a connection or making the model of a connection. Um, and uh, I feel that 
I feel that uh, more applicable in more places. So that it used to be, I, I mean, it used to be that I, my, my, my window, my perspective was very limited. I could only, for instance, I was only noticing, if I was only noticing women and they were beautiful. And my, my, my estimation of what beautiful is, is, is grown 360 degrees yeah. so that so that that's not even so and it sounds like it's a real cliche to say that beauty is inner but it actually is actually beauty is inner and it's the part that you can see it's the inner part that you can see and i i dare say that i i see men i i don't i haven't you know i haven't gone as far as some do but i i see men now differently as i grow older i i i can love them you know yeah. not necessarily physically but but everything's physical so it doesn't matter let's just say that the definition of love just you know if you keep not the definition but the 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 uh the characterization of love just keeps getting deeper and larger as you practice as you whatever your practice is yeah and how does uh, bill let me ask you how does service fit into this how do we serve how do we serve with all all that's kicking and swirling around in this conversation what is well, for you yeah yeah um you know when i was a teacher um i taught english as a second language which is a very different job from you know other kinds of teaching um i always i, I was always very aware that i never had to ask myself in the morning why am i why am i doing this why am i getting up because it was so clear to me and that's actually was has has a great that work work had a great deal to teach me about compassion because it was obvious. <laughs> I these kids needed needed to know language. They needed to know the language of the place where they had brought, been brought to. Yeah. And so I think you know I'm still doing that now, but um, I'm doing it as a writer exclusively because I used to mix them up. I used to mix poetry and storytelling and teaching. They were all they were all in there, but. Um, you know that that interaction you know i i bring i bring that interaction into writing you know writing is a terribly solitary thing as you know um mm -hmm. but um but for one who has experienced interaction in the in the in the role of providing um some some value to others um it's been a it's been a great grounding for for writing I, when I started, even when I started storytelling, I thought, I don't know if I can do this because, you know, on some level, it was like, you know, I was dazzled by Mencken, you know, it's like speech, right? Speech and language and speech. And I thought, I'm, I'm not really like those people. And I'm, and I'm still, I'm, I'm not a natural storyteller. There are a lot of natural storytellers who come out of, often come out of, you know, rural environments. And I'm not like that. And uh, I need, you know, I'm, 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 I'm introverted to a degree, and uh, I need I you know I need I need that time. But when I started storytelling, I thought, well, maybe. And I and I used as a model William Butler Yeats, whom I I read I'm, I've always read, but very very early on. And Yeats, as you know, collected folk tales, and he was very interested in the, the speech of the people, the common people. <laughs> and I thought, well, maybe if I can. If I can engage in the storytelling, if I can practice it, it'll make me a better writer. And it has. Mm -hmm. But it's still making it happen. And it's not just the the practice of, you know, articulating thoughts in a way that um, you can use metaphor, which is what, you know, the, what, what I define is what storytelling is, the use of metaphor in oral speech, in, in oral, oral engagement. But it's also, you know, that uh, it actually brought me among people, <laughs> and it made wow. it made those people still there with me. They're still there, you know, children, but adults too. It's a great grounding, great preparation. Bill, do you have do you have a short, maybe a shorter folk tale or a story that you could tell? Um, yeah, I'm just trying to think the the stories that are occurring to me right now. Here's here's a short one, and this is courtesy of. Uh, um, Barry Lopez, 
had a book of native native tales. So this is a native tale. Um, Coyote. Coyote was uh, walking along, and Coyote came to this. It was getting dark, you know. But just as it was getting dark, he came to this this party where just people were dancing. It's so hard to see, but there's so much dancing going on and and movement and like swaying. And he was really these people. Are, these these are really good. And he 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 was very confident. And he said, "Hey." Look who's here, it's me, Coyote. He said, you're gonna be happy I'm here because I'm a great dancer. And so Coyote started dancing with them, but it just kept getting darker and he, he wasn't able to see them any better. In fact, it was harder to see them except that he knew they were, they were dancing into the night and he began to get tired. And, and he thought, I can't stop exactly because I've, I've told him I'm a great dancer. So he kept on going. And he waited for them to stop, but they didn't stop. It went on all night long. And they, they just swayed back and forth. And Coyote tried to put life into it as much as he could, but he was having such a problem. It was, it was getting hard to lift one foot over the other. And finally, he had to stop. He just, he just had to face it. He couldn't dance another step. And finally, he sat down on the ground. And it was just as the sun was coming up. It was just before the sun came up and it was just beginning to get dawn. And he looked around and he noticed he had been dancing in a field of cattails. Yeah. <laughs> so that's Coyote's enlightenment. Yeah. Wow. I've got a poem. We we I we've talked a lot. It's interesting, and I haven't read it in a while. And it's it's in this book called Hands No Hands, which is coming out from Foothills presently. It's called Blue Crystal Sky, and it's it's a, actually some kind of account of uh, some of the things we've talked about because it's it's it is autobiography in a way. Blue Crystal Sky. It was in another lifetime I came here. No friends or family, far from home. Holding a piece of perfect sky in my right hand to show someone, I guess, I drifted away from human ties. So little holds me down. I thought in those quiet days, nothing keeping me here but the friends and family I had moved away from. And the sky in my hand, it seemed my fate to follow. To go to a place mostly strange, make new friends find my own streets, swing from one tree to the next. All this time, the blue sky in my hand fading. And I didn't know if it was a destiny I had proved unworthy of, the way that would have gotten me solid and connected and real, or if it was just a trick, like Athena, appearing to Hector as Achilles, to lead him to nowhere destruction and save the favored one. I learned to welcome the real sky, the one that's up there, and the necessity of women, children, making money. As metaphor got squeezed, I kept on finding the sunrise lighting the cones of the Norway spruce as the blue icy crystal lost its color, the way autumn oaks give just a flash of red before they turn their mortise brown. Not seeing the great tree that sky was a leaf on. The blue crystal now in the earth to pin me, seeping down to make its hundred million circuits through my heart. 